Very good afternoon. It's a new lecture of the New Energy Academy with today a very interesting topic. We will talk about the circular economy, also, of course, in light of the energy transition. And where could you get a better guest speaker than from a company called Circle Economy? Claudia Alesso, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting us. It's a, it's a topic that we're actually really interested in and uh, very actual, so happy to give some thoughts into it. Yeah, I thought so. I think, well, the, the biggest uh, work you've done so far, or the most uh, well-known, is the Circularity Gap Report, which we'll be uh, discussing during this lecture as well. Um, but to give a short introduction uh, for the audience about uh, about you, could you tell me maybe how you ended up at Circle Economy? Uh, I mean, it's a pretty basic story. Uh, I studied economics in Maastricht, where I'm calling from at the moment, actually. Uh, and thanks to my university program, I could do an internship uh, in Buenos Aires, and I ended up working for the Ministry of Environment in the Waste Management Department. And that's kind of like a good entry point in uh, the discourse around circular economy. Uh, waste is always the most common. So after the internship, I kind of decided, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I came back to the Netherlands to do my master. And uh, in Amsterdam, I found the circle economy. Yeah, it's great. Well, very interesting company. Um, so if you want to know more, I would advise you to have a look. I think they've, uh, well, it's the fifth circularity gap report so far. Um, so that, uh, that could be interesting. And they also look, well, into something that's interesting for all, as well, all of us. But the changes on the, on the labor market, if you're moving on to a circular economy, um, there will be some changes which could be uh, could be interesting as well. Um, so, as that, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's time uh, to, to move uh, move on with the introduction. I would like to point out our uh, upcoming activities, and of course, we have a good quiz coming up. So, if it's your first time joining, make sure your phone is charged and you have them close by. Um, as said, upcoming activities. Next week, we have a technical lecture. We will discuss plasma, the app applications of plasma for, um, for energy. And the week after, we have the company AAZ Wind. It stands uh, of its short for Enschede aan Zee. It's a small windmill. Uh, also very interesting. I think it could be a very interesting feature for the production of uh, renewable energy. And on the 3rd of March, we have a micro MBA. We will discuss a sustainable recovery after COVID with uh, with a few companies, among others, uh, just dig it. So that could be uh, interesting as well. And last but not least, I would like to point out the different uh, information about the different certificates. We have currently four certificates. One is the Energy Academy certificate for the universities in, in Groningen, um, and the Energy Transition Challenge for the other universities, but we also have two mini courses, one focusing on the Northern Energy region and the other more on the global energy dynamics. And I think it's, uh, it certifies that you have a broad scope of the energy transition. It's also interesting since you can add these certificates on LinkedIn, which could be interesting for your resume. And one thing I would like to point out is the acceleration. Um, you can see in the Energy Transition Challenge, we have a one-page paper we have a few examples on our website, but it could be interesting to share your ideas about how we could accelerate the energy transition. Um, I will share a link in the chat as well, but I would like to, to share this with you. And if you want to go for the certificates, you can hand in your, um, your school and ECTS at energyacademy at newenergycoalition.org. So that's about the certificates and the upcoming lectures. And now before we start, we're going to the Kahoot quiz. I have to quickly switch screens in a second, which gives you the chance to get your phone out and make sure you go to Kahoot.it. And if so, you should be able to see my screen again, the monitor of the Kahoot quiz. The game pin is 108600. Claudia, I would normally invite the guest speaker to join, but I think you know too much of the topic now because I have a good look in the circularity gap report. So I have to exclude you this time. Okay, fair enough. So I said, go to kahoot.it 
an entry game pin. And I hope that some of my colleagues are joining on their own name. Some of them are joining on a false name to prevent them from standing out if they get a low score. <clears throat> Last few seconds before we join. <clears throat> okay, it's time to start heading out to the first question. And I said, the faster you answer, the more points you get. According to the Circularity Gap Reports, how circular is our world? Yeah, and I see you smiling, Claudia. Of course, you know this. Is it 2.3%, 5.7%, 8.6%, or 11.2%? And it is 8.6%. I see a lot of you chose 5.7%. So a reason to be a bit more optimistic but on the other hand as I said it also shown in the report 91% of our world is actually going to waste I'm gonna see Bit, Veda and Kate were the three fastest ones well done we're heading out to the second question Claudia has gained experience working with cities throughout three continents which is not one of them is it Australia Europe North America or South America? And I have to admit that I always tend to end with a question about the guest speaker, but I think I did something wrong with the, uh, the order of the question. So we have now a second question about you, Claudia. <laughs> nice. And I think most of you listened well as well, because you said you worked in uh, Buenos Aires, so South America wasn't an option. And of course, you're working in Amsterdam now, which leaves the other two, but just a few chose North America and most of you chose Australia. And I see Steve, oh, it could be my colleague, but I'm not sure, but she's the fastest one on the first two questions. Not bad. Heading out to the third questions. Between the Paris Agreement and COP26 in Glasgow, which was a few months ago, we managed to consume how much tons of materials? Is it 4 billion tons, 40 billion tons, 150 billion tons, or 500 billion tons? <clears throat> and it's actually quite shocking. It's 500 billion tons. And I, I tried to look at how big it actually was, but I think if we have all the humans on our planet right now together, then we would have 500 billion kilos. So you still have to, well, put a factor of 1,000 on it to equal this weight, which is quite shocking, and 90% of that is going to landfill. So there's a lot of work to do. And Steve-O is actually doing a great job. With quite a gap to the second spot. When we're heading to the fourth question. By doubling our circularity, we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by how much percent? 13, 22, 31, or 39? Yeah, you would have knew them all, uh, Claudia, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, thank God, yes. Yeah. But it's good, it's oh, good. Wow. You can see if some participants who are interested and have, a, have a, had a look at the circularity gap report as well. And I see okay. the correct answer is 39%. See, a lot of you got it correct, but it's... Uh, well, I was surprised by the number, actually, how big it was. And <laughs> helpful and, posit and positive. Sometimes we need positive. Yeah, <laughs> Again, Steve O makes it quite exciting for the last question. When Katrik and Vasilis are pretty close. Question five or five. The biggest material mass reduction could be achieved by which of these four options? Reducing floor space, circular construction materials, increase housing durability, 
or improve the vehicle utilization. So what would save the most materials? And actually one got it correct. It's reducing floor space. I was uh, a bit surprised by it as well. What interesting insights from the report. Um, most of you thought circular construction materials, but no, it was uh, reducing floor space. Maybe, uh, or guest speaker can elaborate a bit on that uh, during the presentation. Mm -hmm. But I would say we can have a look at first. The bronze medal is for Facilis. Silver is going to Catpick. And I think Steve O is there with the golden medal. And now I'm really curious if it is my colleague or not, but I will ask her in a second. Um, <laughs> For now, thank you for for joining the quiz. It's time to uh, to move on to the presentation of our guest speaker. And I will switch the screens, which you should be able to see now. Correct? Yeah. And then I can give you control. Can you check if you have the control? Mm, yes, not yet. See. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. All right. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, I will leave you for now, Claudia, and get back to you at the Q&A. I might have to use the mouse for a second to turn my camera off. Uh, but good luck and thanks again for joining. Of course. Thank you for inviting us. So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm now, yeah, I can still see the best slides. Perfect. Uh, as Heine uh, anticipated, I'm Claudia Lessi, I'm a research analyst at the Circle at Circle Economy, mainly working with the Cities program. For those who don't know us yet, uh, Circle Economy is a foundation, uh, so a non-profit organization based in Amsterdam, and our aim is of accelerating the global transition to a circular economy. We mainly work uh, with businesses, cities and nations, and uh, what we want to do is to empower them with the practical and scalable solutions to put the circular economy into action. And today we will see how uh, the circular economy and the energy transition and the agenda can actually complement each other to achieve uh, carbon neutrality. Yeah. So we're going to first see what is a circular economy so we can gain a basic understanding uh, of what that concept means then we will see how it can be applied in the context of energy systems, how it works in practice with a few uh, examples. And um, also we can see today how it, jobs will be part of this transition because uh, in a circle economy, we also have a program that is uh, completely dedicated to uh, circular jobs because uh, it's also important to, also, to find a balance between environment and society as well. Uh, and then we can see and conclude with a few next steps of this transition. Yeah. So what is the circular economy and uh, why it's important? A linear economy, the economy that currently prevails worldwide, traditionally follows the take, make and waste path. This means that raw material are extracted, transformed into products, used and finally discarded as waste. In this economic system, basically, value is created by producing and selling as many products as possible. In a circular economy, instead, uh, materials and products are used to their fullest potential and are continuously reused, refurbished, and recycled in a system that is that could be potentially uh, waste-free. So, in this way, we can say that the circular economy kind of aims to achieve an inclusive economic, social, environmental prosperity within the boundaries of our planet. Mainly the bottom line is by making efficient use as of resources. And as we've seen now with the quiz, uh, the status of the circular economy is not doing great. Uh, we estimated a circular economy that in 2021 the world was 8.6% circular. This means that 8.6% of the materials that uh, we use globally are cycled back into the economy. And this leaves what we call like a massive circularity gap. There's a bad side to it. In 2018, the world was 9.1% uh, circular, meaning that since then, the global circularity actually went down. There is a good side, <laughs> as always, because uh, we actually only need to roughly double the current uh, 86 to limit global warming to well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
So what it means, the circularity gap, so how we can close it? Well, we basically need to move from a uh, society that takes materials, yeah, makes products, but also wastes them and disposes of them. And we need to actually cycle back materials and uh, close the circularity gap. And uh, now that we gain kind of like a basic understanding of what a circular economy means, uh, we can also see how it is important in the context of the energy transition. And also this is what we mentioned before in the quiz. Uh, the harsh reality is not only that the circularity gap is getting worse, but between Paris and Glasgow, more, more than half a trillion tons of materials were consumed. In the six years between uh, these uh, climate conferences, the global economy me, this means that basically the global economy consumed 70% more of what the Earth could safely replenish. In only 50 years, as you can see in the graph, the global use of materials has nearly quadrupled, uh, outpacing population growth. In 1972, uh, when the Club of Rome's report The Limits to Growth was published, the world consumed 28 billion tons. By 2000, this had gone up to 54. 55 actually, uh, and it, as of 2019, it surpassed 100 billion tons. And of course, this uh, rapid acceleration of consumption came with the rising waste levels. And this means that we are living outside of planetary boundaries as we speak. So what we want to do and we, what we need to do collectively is reimagine and redesign a system to ensure a safe and just space for all. And the circular economy can help us do that. Uh, in fact, by closing the circularity gap, we can also close the emission gap. So the gap that we need to, cl to close to stay below 1.5 degree uh, Celsius uh, by 2032. And we can do this as we've seen with the, um, as again in the quiz, uh, because by doubling circularity, we can change uh, uh, first uh, emission, we can reduce emission by 39%, and also limit global resource extraction by 28%. These are basically the two main pillars that will get us to steer to a well below 1.5 degree world. So basically what we see is that combining the twin agendas of circular economy and uh, energy or climate mitigation agendas is crucial in moving forward. This is a visual from our fifth circularity gap report. Here we highlight 21 solution, circular solution, that can help uh, cities, businesses, and nations achieve the goals that we just mentioned, transform our use of materials and cut emission, uh, together with the interventions that are already uh, within like, national commitments for energy transition, we can double the circularity metric and uh, bringing it from so 8.6 to around 17. This will help us also meet Paris Agreement, but they need to be complementary. So what you're going to see here is that these 21 solutions need to go in parallel to the uh, targets, uh, energy, renewable energy targets and energy efficiency targets. Uh, for these solutions, in general, uh, as a quick overview, the figure shows the potential to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions as the width of the box, so like each colored box, uh, and the material footprint reduction is instead um, indicated by the height of the box. So the image shows the contribution of each intervention as a separate, but also uh, as a whole, so as all interventions combined. You can read more in our report, but basically what the bottom line is here is that to close both the emission and the circularity gaps, we need to work on both circular economy and energy transition agenda. And this is also because in general, it's true that COP26 revealed that most nations see energy efficiency and the transition from fossil fuels to renewable as the main key to deliver net zero emission. But these areas only account for 55% of greenhouse gas emission. The other 45% is embodied in everyday products, such as our cars, clothes, buildings, and food. So renewables are not necessarily a silver bullet, uh, the technologies also have material requirements which can add to the impact of a linear economy and uh, basically increase demand for materials. 
So transitioning from a take, make, waste linear economy to a circular one, in which basically waste is designed out and where products and materials are reused, cascaded, remanufactured, as we've seen before, is the only way to tackle this 45% uh, left and limit global warming. What we see uh, is that, however, harnessing these opportunities uh, needs a holistic thinking. Uh, the figure here is by the European Environmental Protection Agency, and it basically highlights some key feature of a circular clean energy system that is basically on a whole holistic value chain approach. So for, so from material extraction to design, manufacturing practices, maintenance and equipment, and then only at the end, end of life management. So from now on, we can also see in, at each of these steps how circular economy principles can have a positive impact on these uh, uh, parts of the energy system. But before we do that, let's just also see what are uh, circular economy principles. Let's see. Yeah. So uh, circular economy defines them thanks to a conceptual framework of uh, eight key elements that can apl be applied at different levels, both uh, national, regional, uh, or at a business or even at a product level. They are mainly um, defined as core elements. Uh, so core elements are the ones that like deal directly with the uh, physical flows and align with the uh, other common frameworks related to the circular economy while enabling elements those are the five that you see more like in the outer ring are the one that deal more with creating the conditions of removing barriers for a circular transition so uh, here you can see also how the energy transition is a core element of circularity as it relates to the first point, uh, prioritizing regenerative resources. And other core elements are stretching the lifetime of what already exists and, uh, of course, using waste as a resource. In terms of uh, enabling elements, whoop. Um, yeah, wait, one less. Yeah, uh, uh, enabling elements can accelerate this uptake of circularity by removing a, a few obstacles. So, for example, these are related to new knowledge and research, new collaborations, new technologies, but also new business models and new ways of designing products and services. So now we can see how all these principles can be applied throughout the supply chain of energy systems and solve a few of the challenges. Yeah, one first challenge is definitely uh, how we source materials that we need to build the required renewable energy production capacity. So solar, wind and batteries mainly. These technologies will rely on rare metals and other earth elements. And uh, this actually implies that in the future, much more materials could be used to meet renewable energy targets. Uh, I posted here a picture from a metabolic uh, study that calculated that to realize the renewable energy production targets for 2030 of the Netherlands, uh, the country would require between 2.4 and 3.2 million tons of metals, and this demand could quadruple by 2050. Basically, what they find is that if the rest of the world developed renewable energy capacity at a comparable pace of the Netherlands, we would incur in a shortage of rare materials uh, worldwide. So how can the circular economy help? Well, all core principles of the circular economy can help change this and reduce material, uh, raw material extraction. Basically, by prioritizing uh, regenerative resources, we move uh, towards using non-critical and non-toxic materials instead. But also by stretching the lifetime of energy assets, we make sure that we need, we need less materials to begin with and uh, also by recycling materials we reduce the need for new ones a practical example for this for example would be uh, in order maybe to reduce the raw material extraction and increase the use of uh, uh, secondary raw materials we could set uh, criteria for a minimum content of recycled uh, elements in uh, uh, energy infrastructure for instance a second challenge uh, around the energy system is definitely design. Uh, when you don't think 
about design, many problems can arise in the handling of energy equipment. Uh, for instance, just as a simple example, uh, sometimes there are many difficulties in handling solar panels due to access because they are uh, often installed at height or maybe uh, this thing, these elements of like location are not anticipated at the design stage. Um, as well as batteries, for example, like battery designs uh, kind of like influence uh, different requirements uh, and different logistics uh, that can lead to different approach in handling this kind of infrastructure. So design is a crucial element to build better and more efficient equipment and also handle operations in a better way. And circle economy can help at this stage as well because we need to first design things that make better use of materials and energy in a more efficient way. So this is all about efficiency of energy use, but also efficiency of material use. We also need to start facilitating recycling and reuse of energy equipment. So to improve both durability, repairability and recyclability. Uh, in all this design can help uh, also at end of life. So evaluate the recycling potential and hazardousness of materials used and also making sure that end of life management can be circular. Um, well, as, as well, for example, like in the case of energy storage, increased circularity can be supported through modular standardized design to promote remanufacturing. And also having more information about content uh, can help reduce the high impact of materials. Another important element here is also digital tools because they can help keep track of materials, maybe with digital passport and information for the future use. And then definitely uh, research and development is crucial here to find out that new cutting edge materials so that we can substitute the critical ones. Then we can, another challenge is definitely related to the handling of equipment uh, and the manufacturing and kind of like stock maintenance of the energy equipment. Here, the best example is the case of uh, offshore wind farms. So for example, off offshore renewable energy is definitely among the renewable technologies with the greatest potential to scale up. Um, and it, it will play, uh, and it is playing a crucial role in uh, meeting the EU emission and fossil fuel reduction target in 2030, uh, as well as the commitment to climate neutrality by 2050. However, due to the remote location, installation, maintenance and logistics are often very difficult. Uh, thinking of circularity thinking can help uh, manufacturing and stock management, uh, various different things. So for example, um, by applying circular thinking, we can uh, go and have like preventive maintenance strategy that can help extend service life for this type of infrastructure as well as uh, repairing a faulty components and upgrading uh, different components uh, if they are modular for example and this is also when design uh, comes in uh, and also this type of strategies uh, uh, work super well uh, when coupled with digital technology here you see an example of a few um, like robots that can, they were used to, instead of like manual labor, to actually go and maintain wind turbines. But as well, like for instance, digital products passport for equipment can provide information about materials, help the substitution and repair. And as you see, indeed, like drones uh, can do this for us. And also when uh, there is a complicated process uh, offshore. Finally, also here, circular business models are protagonist in the sense that we can, uh, uh, circularity can be applied in terms of new business models or leasing models or other service-based contracts that can help prioritize whole life cycle approaches and improve equip equipment operation and maintenance. Or they can simply focus on remanufacturing and reuse of the commissioning equipment uh, for other applications. Then last but not least, of course, we have uh, the challenge about waste. Uh, the energy transition, as we uh, saw before, will require significant material reuse and will generate a substantial amounts of uh, new types of waste that we haven't seen necessarily before. Um, 
at the moment waste generation is rather low but it's mainly because these installations are relatively new and generally have not been kind of exhausted uh, they didn't finish their useful lifespan but figures in waste generation will see a dramatic increase in uh, uh, waste generation basically the expected growth of waste material is up to plus three thousand percent for photovoltaics 200 for wind and energy and 600 for energy storage and mobility and recovering these materials is going to be difficult uh, there are going to be a few challenges uh, mainly processing difficulties uh, due to the use of composite materials so materials that are uh, multi-layered or there are different materials in one the presence of hazardous substances so um, that cannot be easily recycled um, and also the fact that sometimes in this equipment the materials are not necessarily considered uh, valuable uh, another challenge related to the definitely the equipment itself that is not designed to facilitate end of life recyclability and here we go back to the design principle and how to dismantle it it can be difficult Currently, there is also a lack of uh, recycling capacity worldwide. Uh, battery recycling, for example, is not well advanced and we don't have large scale recycling capabilities in general worldwide. Uh, lastly, also logistical issues uh, arise due to the remote locations, size and safety requirements associated with this energy infrastructure. This has often led to the dumping of unsuitable technologies on third countries and or export of this equipment to location where waste management practices might not be uh, optimal so uh, we definitely need to change this course and uh, we can see that by using this waste as a resource uh, a core circularity principle we can limit the negative impact of uh, energy waste so despite the challenges, the opportunities are there. In fact, 95% of materials in solar panels can actually be recycled, uh, in mainly glass, copper, and aluminum. 90% uh, of materials in wind turbines can be recycled, and 100% uh, of materials in, uh, that constitute energy storage and mobility assets. So we can see that circular economy principles, such as using waste as a resource, can help first to ensure effective waste management for end-of-life infrastructure but also to maximize recycling of components and materials and provide the secondary raw materials for the new energy infrastructure that we're going to need and then this will also kind of like require the few enabling elements on the other side of for example the implementation of standards for treatment of this energy waste that we don't have yet because we need to make sure that once this waste is recycled we have uh, performance and standard requirement that ensures that we can use it again and that is of high quality or quality that is good enough for subsequent use. So these were like kind of the main challenges so far but what we want I also wanted to kind of like touch upon is how this will impact jobs so who's going to participate in the transformation uh, and who's going to participate in the circular economy transition. And for this, uh, as I said, Circular Economy works uh, very closely with the partners' organization to understand how we can make uh, also jobs more circular. In general, uh, we always say that the circular economy alters the way like goods and services are produced and consumed, and consumed, and basically this has a consequence on the relationship between capital and labor. The relationship changes in four ways. Uh, new jobs are created. So, for instance, uh, we also know that like every 100,000 of resources that are recycled instead of incinerated or disposed, 36 additional jobs are created across the supply chain of products. Then we know that some jobs will be substituted by others, maybe more circular. Some will be lost and others will be redefined as the tasks and skills required uh, of workers will change. The impact, kind of like uh, bulk impact, uh, has been estimated by the International Labour Organization, uh, which basically um, in 2019, I believe, uh, so it might be a bit uh, changed now, but especially during the uh, COVID pandemic, 
but uh, they estimated that nearly 78 million jobs uh, will be created and almost 71 million destroyed within a circular economy transition coupled with uh, the energy transition agenda. And of those workers whose jobs are destroyed, a large portion also, like as you can see, is like uh, almost um, 49 million will find the vacancies within the same occupation so they can be like reabsorbed uh, in other industries. And that's this will require a uh, reallocation. The remainder, 29 million jobs, will be created without reallocation, and a little under two, uh, 22 million will be destroyed. So um, without vacancies in the same occupation opening up for other industries. And uh, how these kind of like uh, jobs that will be destroyed that can be reallocated is through upskilling and reskilling. Uh, from a result of a survey, we see that employers in Europe expect to offer reskilling and upskilling to over 70% of their employees by 2050, but only 21% say that they, there will be an, if sufficient funding to support these initiatives. So the willingness is there, but a lot of people could be left behind because not enough attention is being, is being given to this problem. And because not enough attention is being given to this program, it's kind of also important to learn from best practices. For example, uh, as some of you might know, Germany could be considered a successful example. The country is phasing out coal and transitioning to renewables. And uh, while uh, fossil fuel related labor has decreased, thanks to the work of labor unions, workers were able to take collective action and preserve jobs. So today, coal workers have moved uh, into renewables. More than actually 20 in a thousand jobs in uh, a few regions in Germany were generated by the renewable energy sector. And at home, also where the mines were, uh, mine sites are being turned into cultural venues and museums, uh, opening opportunities for new kinds of jobs. So this is a perfect example of how circular use of assets and circular use of people can help uh, achieve a positive impact. We also have like a few other examples, practical example, um, one for business. Uh, a business in Scotland uh, is refurbishing, is already kind of like cutting edge in the refurbishing uh, wind turbines. They're called the renewable parts. They're basically a supply chain and a refurbishment uh, specialist in the wind energy industry. Founded in 2011, they focus on uh, circular economy best practices and uh, refurbish and remanufacture wind turbines components uh, to divert waste from landfill. They also supply uh, kind of like expertise and consulting services to their customers to guarantee the high performance standard of their parts solution. And they also, to link back with the job, they, they kind of like believe that continually developing the skills and technology used in the industry will help open up different markets uh, within Scotland as by is a fact that like remanufacturing this is actually more labor intensive than traditional manufacturing so they're giving more jobs opportunities uh, as well as other benefits for example like because they, they found that um, remanufacturing can also cut production costs between 34 and 60 percent and then uh, on my side uh, uh, city example I work mostly with cities uh, in general, cities are responsible for a lot of the resource consumption and uh, waste and emissions that we produce worldwide. But because so many people live in cities and the infrastructure in cities is the most advanced, uh, they are crucial for innovation and uh, circular economy action. Um, for this reason, a lot of the attention is also focused on urban development. An example here on how energy can link to the circular economy is a uh, uh, circular economy heat consortium created to improve the governance of energy efficiency by focusing on circular waste heat utilization in Central Europe. So basically what the consortium did is training municipality on waste heat recovery, challenges and opportunities so that they could uh, take action and contribute to the latest energy efficiency directive uh, by the EU. The consortium has so far developed a joint waste heat map so they collect all data for all partners uh, combined in a platform and uh, um, combined also with the several guides for 
policy making and uh, uh, a guide for investment for and future action plans. And last but not least, uh, we have an example for action at the higher level, national. Unfortunately, at this level, we can see that uh, circular economy and energy agenda are not necessarily well connected, the, uh, or not yet, hopefully. The AU is leading by example for sure, um, is one of the few institutions that have, has linked climate and circular economy agenda. Uh, in fact, the new circular economy action plan is one of the main building blocks of the European Green Deal. But also, nations will need to follow. Uh, a few have taken steps. Italy is uh, in favor or like now setting up an energy transition uh, with a few reforms, among which a national strategy on a circular economy. And the Netherlands is also uh, linking a circular economy with emission reduction targets. And what I also want to stress here that it, it, it is important for us uh, in Europe to start acting in this direction because, uh, as we all know, lower income nations contribute the fewest to emission and material consumption, but are the most vulnerable to the impact uh, of climate breakdown and the negative impact of resource depletion. So it's, we need to start here in the EU and other Western countries and uh, uh, only a few nations are so far taking steps. Uh, in general, like I have included a lot of examples here that are available in our knowledge hub. You can have a look. I sent the, uh, posted the link in the slide, and it's a um, great repository uh, online webpage of over 5,000 cases from all over the world and showing how different stakeholders can apply circular economy principles. And um, it's kind of like a Wikipedia style uh, uh, hub in the sense that you can also upload your own cases and the content is owned by the community so everyone can edit and uh, update content. So you can have a look there also on cases that link, more cases that link circularity and uh, uh, energy transition. So we are almost at the end. I wanted to conclude with a few uh, remarks. Uh, we know that climate change is a uh, imminent danger uh, and more political attention is needed uh, for the circular transition alongside the energy agenda uh, to kind of widen a bit the perspective to understand all impacts. Uh, I don't think any framework or priority was ever intended to stand alone and address every problem in the world. And uh, this basically means that, for example, if we go fully renewable in a linear industrial system, we will keep mining virgin resources, often in terrible conditions for human, destroying habitats, uh, biodiversity, and sometimes potentially doing more harm than good. So the energy transition is also not enough to reach a 1.5 warmer world by itself, and circularity can help complement uh, the actions set by renewable energy targets. And uh, what how it can be done we have seen it today circularity can reduce material extraction to meet the needs for a new energy infrastructure it can help design better technologies for energy and renewable energy improve stock management via maintenance and repair and allow for effective end of life treatment of all the energy waste that we expect to receive in a couple of decades uh, and this will in turn reduce the economy's dependence on critical materials and recycle them internally. Aside from that, as you can see in the slide, I think like having a focus on the symptoms kind of deflects us from targeting the root cause. So uh, we need to kind of move away from the carbon tunnel vision. Circularity can help us do that as we need to kind of address the root cause. There are materials and uh, what lies behind all the emissions that we're talking about and embedding circularity across nations, cities and business is one way to, in, to do this, but we also need to fully understand the impact of circular and clean energy strategies and make sure that the right set of skills and knowledge are widely available. So at the end, it basically starts with students like you uh, being at the crossroad of this to transition and learning how we can achieve a positive impact and how we can actually do this in practice. So I hope this was uh, insightful enough. And uh, I think we have a few more minutes for questions, but I don't have access to the questions. So 
I'll ask Hain to uh, mediate for that. And it's possible, uh, Claudia. First of all, thank you. It was a, a solid story. I'm not sure, was it your last slide? No, this, this should be your last slide. Um, no, great story, I said, and I think the, 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 well, the last message you gave uh, will totally be focused on the carbon tunnel vision because it's so much more if you really want to make something of it. Um, and I think you might have seen it, but the, well, what always impressed me was the documentary of uh, uh, Breaking Boundaries with David Attenborough, uh, which gave really good insight into the different planetary boundaries we are, we are breaking, and that the energy transition is basically just one of them. So um, if you don't know it, I would advise you to watch it. It's it's really interesting. It's on Netflix. Uh, it's a bit longer than an hour, but uh, I would say take a look. And you said indeed I have control of the questions. I have to pick them out right now because you were in charge of my uh, controls. But I have to admit there are a lot of questions. That's a uh, that's a good sign. People are intrigued by your story. Um, let's have a, a quick look. Mm-mm. Yes, about circularity and well recycling materials. Uh, questions coming in from from Ryan. He said the end of life scenario and recyclability of waste uh, from renewables are close to ninety percent, uh, according to your slide, which you said about solar, uh, wind materials, and, uh, and the batteries. Um, but his question is, could it be downcycling? So would the material be used for the same purpose or would it be downgraded for lower use? But you can imagine that a lithium can be used for the exact same quality battery. No, yeah, I think like the, the 95, 90 and 100% uh, figures are for all types of recycling. So it's both, uh, it could be upcycling as well with if a new technology allow, but uh, it also considers a downcycling. So yeah, cycling in other also in other industries. Yeah, yeah, okay. And as you said, the number uh, thirty nine percent will be the reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions if we double our circularity. Uh, question is, is the um, the energy that's required for recycling also included? Because you can imagine that recycling sometimes takes well, needs more energy than just a new product. Mm -hmm. I would need to necessarily like I don't I work with cities so I'm not necessarily super involved with the methodology of the circularity gap report but I'm sure that there is a clear methodology document online so you can find that there. Um, but I don't I can't really answer that question now like, also because of the point is that yeah it it also requires different life cycle assessments across time. Uh, so you need to take also into account technological development, which is always tricky um, in a future scenario. But I can maybe share the link with you, Hen, and you can cycle it back. Yeah, I can share it with the audience as well. That, that, that would be wise. Um, we could share with the slides after the presentation. Yeah. So I think that's fine. Okay. And there was a slide which said, well, the circular economy opportunities. Um, you mentioned something about stretching the lifetime and rethinking the business model of wind turbines. Um, but we have in the uh, working, uh, or at least you heard it work, that most wind turbines in the Netherlands are disassembled uh, after 50 years. Um, but it could be because of the business model, because he thinks that wind turbines should be able to proceed for a longer lifetime. Um, would you have any suggestions on how governance can play a role to make wind turbines more circular? Well, I mean, like it's stretching the lifetime is a, a good starting point. So, like it, it, we shouldn't necessarily design to uh, disassemble earlier on, uh, but as late as possible. The point here is also kind of like the jobs play a role. Uh, we did. Uh, I can provide an example of. Uh, Scotland because I worked on a report that uh, investigated how we could do this in practice and basically what, what Scotland is doing is that it's 
planning the decommissioning of also a lot of uh, uh, oil and gas platforms offshore and yeah. they're using the same workforce to dismantle these and recycle as much as possible and reuse as much as possible uh, onshore and retake all the materials offshore again to um, build wind turbines. And this basically means yeah. that uh, we can source a lot of materials from existing uh, infrastructure. So oil and gas platform uh, out there in the sea can still be used for uh, other uses. And we can also use the same people, local people that work in those industries. Uh, in the future, those industries will be phased out, but they don't need to lose their jobs because, uh, and this was a quote that they, uh, uh, an interview of, of mine said like, if you know how to build it, you know also how to dismantle it. So you can definitely use the same people to help you do this in practice in the next yeah. 20 to 30 years. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, well, we again a bit about the, the competences and the, the skills of people, and that's interesting because there's also a, a question about this, uh, about upscaling and rescaling the current labor force. Um, but how can we? You also mentioned, well, it starts with you, with the students who are watching and education. Um, but how can we support, well, like the youth or the younger people who are still studying um, to go into the, the system of transitioning of this current, current complex system? What, what advice would you give to uh, regarding the competences you need? Well, I think the com like it's not about necessarily the competences. It's also about the competences that you need, but also it's kind of like the competences that are made available. And we see that now, uh, I mean, maybe at higher level education, sustainability is really taking a step forward. Like you, you see at universities around the world uh, focusing much more on this topic and having dedicated um, uh, courses to it, the masters, the bachelors, uh, MBAs as well. Um, but it, it can also start with the professional education, right? Like you need, when we talk about uh, this upskilling and reskilling, we're also thinking about like a lower level of, an, of employment so in the sense of like more manual, like in the waste management departments or in uh, uh, construction, for example. And of course, there is gonna be like two parts of this uh, practical uh, core jobs, but also uh, what we define core jobs, so like this kind of waste management uh, part uh, or yeah. so on the work, but there also gonna need to be like the enabling jobs. So architects they know how to do this, uh, designers they know how to create new products, and also researchers they knew they know how to uh, evaluate uh, different impacts across life cycles, uh, conduct multi life cycle assessments or uh, also just like research about material properties and uh, come up with the new cutting edge materials that maybe will require less energy to be recycled. Yeah, true. So, but it, yeah, fully agree. It basically starts before you assemble the product, you know, have to, you have to build it to dis disassemble it basically yeah. as well. Um, yes, that, that's one question coming in as well. First, I need to mention that I think there are too many questions coming in to answer them all, so my apologies for that. I try to, to pick out the most interesting or most in line with the story, uh, but don't feel uh, fast if your question is not picked out. I could have missed them. Uh, but the question is, how do you see the applicability of the right to repair in a circular economy? Well, it depends on like uh, also the um, time frame we're talking about, but I think there is willingness to move towards this direction, uh, but as we said before, like it's it's really a matter of uh, uh, convincing people that that's the right thing to do. In the sense that we need business models to also uh, change accordingly, and uh, producers of products uh, joining in, and this can be done uh, the soft or, or the hard way. So the EU is actually uh, thinking of. You know, legislation about this so that uh, there is a clear incentive uh, to move towards that direction. I don't know if that kind of like answers the questions a bit. 
but I mean, I think it's a positive development and that we're actually moving forward. At least in Europe, it's something that I think is going to happen very soon. Yeah. Yeah. But would it be something that is uh, bottom up or more top down? Because I have the feeling that it's not really coming from top down by governments. Uh, if you have, for example, the, the company Patagonia, the clothing company, mm -hmm. or really promoting, well, not to buy their products, but also if there's something of their, like a jeans that breaks down after three years, way after your uh, order service, they still offer the chance to send it to them and repair it. So you don't have to buy any new jeans. Um, but that's more bottom down from Patagonia itself. Well, you could argue that it could be, yeah, prohibited for companies, or prohibited, obliged for companies. This is exactly what this is exactly what I mean in the sense that like I think in Europe we're gonna move much faster into this because the EU yeah. is actually setting new laws for manufacturing uh, and they're kind of like now legally ob obliging uh, producers of different types of goods like uh, electric and electronics uh, to be repaired between uh, yeah. like I don't remember but there is a time span within the law and actually I think the the law is effective as of March 2021, so uh, it's coming both ways. I think uh, the I think these laws never appear just because uh, it's a top-down thing. I think there is always a willingness from bottom up, so it's always a mix of things. But in Europe, we are complementing both bottom up approaches and top down. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's a bit of a bubble. Like a lot of uh, places in the world are not following. <laughs> No, true, and it's, that's the main point. But still, you, you can't deny that you have to. You still have to make an example. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's same, forward. Yeah, it's the same as like uh, yeah, as I was saying before, like the energy and climate, uh, energy and climate agenda with the circular economy agenda are well linked uh, at the European level. But very few countries are doing this, or at least like now it's, we're just like at very infancy stage. So. Uh, Europe is definitely setting an example, but people need to follow it. Yeah. Yeah. True, true. Hey, time's always up. Almost up. I think one last question about a topic that, that interests me as well. A plastic waste. Plastic waste. Um, Ever-growing, but also damaging plastic. How can we reuse plastic waste in cities to a better extent? Are there ideas at Circle Economy? Um, yeah, I mean, we focus mostly on avoiding plastic waste to begin with. Um, so we have, uh, we've worked with cities that have done a lot in this regard, for example, on deposit return schemes for um, uh, reusable food containers. So, you know, like you go to a restaurant in a city, uh, pick up a Tupperware for a deposit fee, and then you can use it in multiple uh, restaurants and locations to actually uh, take out food. And that kind of avoids uh, plastic waste to begin with. Uh, another strategy in that regard is, for example, something that it's so kind of like intuitive, but uh, water fountains in cities really avoid uh, the use of plastic bottles and uh, decrease the plastic waste generations in urban areas by far. And this it kind of also creates an incentive to um, ensure that the water quality is uh, up to uh, safety standards uh, in terms of like when waste is actually created it really depends because there are so many different types of waste um, we often find that now like a problem is also the contamination from biodegradable plastics in normal plastics because people are not necessarily aware of how they should handle these two types of waste they can be right. put together so like you see it's bioplastic it's called plastic but it shouldn't go with the plastic recycling so that then the cities that handle this type of waste are finding it harder uh, because the contamination rates are uh, increasing. So yeah. there are challenges and opportunities, but I would say like, let's start with reducing plastic waste to begin with because plastic waste management uh, is definitely a more challenging uh, issue. It really is. It's everywhere. Uh, but then again, I hope this, uh, this speech of you inspired a lot of people to uh, make the world a bit more circular. Um, we just get in a small uh, tip about a very interesting course on EDX. Uh, thank you, Valentina. She mentioned there is a course on EDX uh, about planetary boundaries. So if you're interested in the documentary, uh, Breaking Boundaries, then this is uh, 
an interesting watch as well. Um, for now, I think it's, uh, it's time to end the webinar. As said, there were too many questions to answer them all, but I think that's, uh, that's a good sign as well. Uh, Claudia, I really enjoyed the talk. I hope same you did the same. Actually, if, you, if you can download the questions, maybe I can have a look and because uh, I would be interested to see like what kind of what sparked attention. Yeah, sure thing. I will uh, I will send all the questions to you so you have a few extra days of work. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> For now, thanks a lot. Um, I hope we stay in touch with uh, also with Circle Economy, very interesting uh, company uh, which I might address i saw some uh, internships possibilities at circle economy so if you're interested please have a look um, i hope there's some interesting people uh, joining you as well um, for now thanks a lot have a wonderful day and i hope to see the attendees next week again at the applications of plasma for energy well enjoy the rest of the program thanks for inviting us thank you bye-bye